So my background is in computer science and psychology, which might sound like a bit of a strange mixture. But something changed recently, which has helped me bring this all together. So in this talk, I'm going to show you how we can use data from the internet to help us understand how people behave. So we're talking about data on what people look for on Google, data on what pages people have looked for on Wikipedia, and data on who speaks to who on Twitter. I'll even show you how we can possibly use this data to anticipate what people are going to do in the future, and maybe even predict or mitigate the consequences of crises. So let's start with Google data. Something really fascinating about this data source is its global span. Never before have we been able to measure what information people are looking for on a global scale. But it can be quite difficult to compare search data between countries because people look for things in different languages. One day, my co-authors and I, so Tobias Price, Jean Stanley, and Stephen Bishop, we had a moment of inspiration when we realized there's one thing which is almost universal between languages. Nearly everywhere in the world, we write down the year in Arabic numerals. So, 2012, 2013, 2014, for example. So, we took data from 2010, and we looked at all countries in the world where there were over 5 million internet users. And we measured how often did they look for the upcoming year, 2011, and how often did they look for the previous year, 2009. On this map, countries who looked more for 2011 are shown in blue. And countries who looked more for 2009, the previous year, are shown in red. And if you look at this map, you might see a bit of a pattern. So a number of the countries who are colored blue, like Australia, Germany, and the UK, for example, are relatively rich. Whereas a number of the countries who are colored red, such as China and India, for example, are relatively poor. So to investigate this relationship in more detail, we created a future orientation index. So we divided the number of times that people had searched for the upcoming year 2011, by the number of times people had searched for the previous year, 2009, for each of these 45 countries. And we found that internet users in countries with a higher per capita GDP search for more information about the future. So why might this be? Well, it's possible that a greater focus on the future either leads to or is encouraged by greater economic success. Or it's also possible that people in countries with better internet infrastructure are more likely to use online information to help them decide what they're going to do in the future. This last point is quite important. Often, when we're looking for information online, we're trying to find information to help us make a decision about something we're going to do afterwards. There are many areas of life where it would be really helpful for us to understand better what people are likely to do in the future. And one of these is the stock markets. What happens in the stock markets doesn't just affect traders. So, for example, the huge fall in stock market prices in 2008 had obvious repercussions for citizens around the world. So my colleagues, Tobias Price, Jean Stanley and I, wondered whether we could perhaps find a link between what financial information people look for online and subsequent stock market moves. In the study I'm going to describe to you, we use data that Wikipedia makes available on how often people have looked at its pages. And we tried to use this data in a hypothetical trading strategy. And the strategy works like this. Let's take a company listed in the Dow Jones, Bank of America, for example. We looked at the Bank of America Wikipedia page in a given week, which we're going to call week T, and we counted how often 
people had looked at that page. And we compared this to how often people had looked at this page in the previous three weeks on average. If we found that people had looked at the Bank of America page less in week T in comparison to the previous three weeks, then we bought stock at the beginning of week T plus one and sold it again the week later. If the other way around, we found that people had looked at the Bank of America page more in week T, then we sold stock at the beginning of week T plus one and bought it back a week later. And we didn't just do this with Bank of America. We did it for all pages relating to the 30 companies in the Dow Jones. So JP Morgan, IBM, for example. Using data that Wikipedia makes available from 2007 onwards until 2012, which is when we carried out this study, this is what we found. So whereas trading randomly every week, so making a random decision to buy or sell within this period, would have, on average, led to no profit or loss. Our Wikipedia page view strategy, using these 30 pages about companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, would have made, according to our analysis, a significant profit during this period. So in other words, we find evidence that an increase in people looking at Wikipedia pages about Dow Jones companies tended to be followed by a fall in stock market prices. So we have a fantastic collaborator at Boston University. His name's Chester Combe. And he tried this out using data on how often people had edited these pages. But there we found there's no signal. This might be for a number of reasons. Possibly, we have less data on edits. So people edit pages less frequently than they view them. Or possibly, the people who edit Wikipedia pages are very different to the people who trade. So to investigate this striking pattern further, we thought we better try this again. So we tried it with a bigger set of 285 pages on general financial concepts, such as macroeconomics, market transparency, for example. And we found exactly the same. Increases in how often people looked at Wikipedia pages about financial topics between 2007 and 2012 tended to be followed by falls in stock market prices. We didn't see any signal in um, the edits for these pages. So would this just work with any old Wikipedia pages? We thought we'd better try something a bit less financial. And so we looked at a set of pages on the profiles of actors and filmmakers. And this is what we found. Nothing. <laughs> so um, it really, you do have to look at the right pages. This is very important. And we find a very similar result if we look at what people look for on Google. So for example, we found between 2004 and 2011, when we carried out that other study, that increases in people looking for the word debt tended to be followed by stock market falls. But increases in people looking for a less financially related word, such as culture, didn't show the same pattern. So overall, we found that increases in people looking for financial information online tended to be followed by stock market falls. What might explain this? One possible explanation is as follows. So, from psychological studies, we know that people care much more about losing five pounds than they do about missing out on gaining five pounds. So we really don't like losing money. We also know, intuitively, it costs us time and energy to look for information. So you'd be prepared to invest much more time researching a car you're considering buying than you would be researching a sandwich you're considering buying. And so if you put all of this together, perhaps investors are the same. Perhaps they're more prepared to invest more time and energy investigating a bigger decision to sell their stocks at a lower price than they believe that they're worth. Given this success, we wondered, are there any other types of crises that we might be able to anticipate using online data? For example, in the summer of 2011, 
England was consumed by riots. If we'd been able to better anticipate where these riots were going to spread to, perhaps we would have been able to reduce some of the damage and loss which ensued. So, this is what we'd like to predict, how the riots spread through England between the 6th and the 10th of August in 2011. Let's say we want to identify the 15% of times and locations which are most risky, considering the days before the riots and the days following the riots too. So if we just pick times and locations at random, performance isn't very good. We only find 15% of the riots. So perhaps we can get some inspiration from crime science. Two colleagues of mine at UCL, Kate Bowers and Shane Johnson, found a really fascinating result. They showed that if a house was burgled, then the probability that another house in the same street would be burgled in the next two weeks rocketed upwards. So perhaps we can use a similar sort of insight and we can build a model where we assume if a riot's just occurred, then a riot is much more likely to occur nearby in the period afterwards. So we tried this. And considering England as a whole, this model's pretty good. The riot started in North London, and the blue dots show that the model correctly predicts that the riot spread through London for the days following. Overall, this model manages to find 79% of the times and locations at which the riots occurred. But there's a catch. The riots didn't just happen in London. The red dots show that on the 8th and the 9th of August, the riots spread to cities in the north and the west of England too. And this model doesn't find them. So why did those riots spread up there? Arguably, this isn't the same as burglaries, where often you have a burglar who returns to the street in the period afterwards. In the case of riots, people hear what others have done, and information flows via our communication networks. So here's a picture of a week of tweets within the UK. Each line represents somebody tweeting and mentioning somebody elsewhere in the UK. And we can use this data to model how information flows through the United Kingdom. And we can assume if a riot occurs in one location and we see lots of communication from that location to a second location, then maybe the risk of riot is going to spread to that second location. If we build this into our model, this is what we see. The model correctly predicts nearly all of the riots which occurred in the north and west of England on the 8th and 9th of August. Overall, this communication network enhanced model predicts 88% of the time and location of the riots in comparison to 79% with a purely distance-based model and 15% with a random model. So our results suggest that patterns of how information spread can help us understand patterns of how behavior spreads. And information spreads through our world at immense pace these days. And this map, which is the result of work with Ryan Compton and Tobias Price, shows us some of this information flow on Twitter. So each mention is colored by language. And the patterns that we see underline the information spreading isn't only affected by distance. So for example, across the vast span of the Atlantic, in white, you see huge amounts of information being exchanged between the UK and the US in our common language, English. The patterns we see here could have all sorts of repercussions for how behavior spreads throughout our world. So to summarize, I've shown you evidence that internet users in countries with a higher per capita GDP tend to look for more information about the future. In a historic analysis, increases in how often people looked at Wikipedia pages about financial topics tended to be followed by stock market falls. And I've also shown you 
that by using data on how people communicate on Twitter, we can potentially improve models of how riots spread. So I hope I've persuaded you that this data can't only help us understand how people make decisions now, but can potentially help us anticipate how people are going to behave in the future in situations where this understanding is really critical. Thank you very much for listening.